Hi, Trev. How are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? Grand, yeah, all good. Uh, yeah, we had uh, some minor technical hiccups. My internet dropped out just at the wrong uh, wrong time. Delightful. Anyway, we are finally here. Hurrah! Uh, Huzzah! Technology and all that sort of stuff. So um, I did send some questions through to you. Um, so just to kick us off, um, what was the first impro show that you saw live? Um, most people's frame of reference is obviously whose line. Um, so we're not thinking screen, we're thinking actually live in a room with a group of people uh, doing stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> so here's the thing. I started like training or rehearsing or whatever have you doing improv, having never seen an actual live improv show um, because there, there wasn't any um, back in when I was starting. So back in like 2004, Liverpool, there was no improv shows that I could remember, like short form shows. Um, did you see Monkey would, Lab at all? That, the, the one that, sorry? Did you catch, did you see Monkey Lab that was the Royal Court produced that was at the Kazakh? No, I didn't see that. But uh, I have just remembered like, when you say improv shows, I was thinking, you know, short form type stuff. But of course, there was the magical hoof, which was doing the rounds back in the day. That was early, early, early very, very early doors. That would have been the first time we ever did it. Yeah. So is it, but I remember saying it because I went to see it as, as a student at Hope University. And then I think I went to see it the next time it was on as a performer. Um, so, yeah, so hoof, there you go. That Your old uh, <laughs> stomping grounds. But, it, but, it's, um, but it's interesting because you're not the first person who said, oh, I've trained before I actually went to see it. So yeah. it's, it's like it seems like most people's experience has been uh, uh, as participant, learning how to do stuff and then kind of going, oh, I'll go and see some other folk and see what they're up to. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that maybe that's something. I don't know. Maybe the time frame uh was like you said there wasn't much stuff around access to it um i think that's massively improved across the country yeah yeah definitely so, um, and yeah. the big show i can remember seeing was one of the the it would be the london improvathon um like their big but that was in preparation for performing in it and that would have been much later like 2009 sort of time and by that point there was a few more uh opportunities to go see improv dotted around the place and a few more groups happening and then going over to Manchester to see comedy sports and a few other people there. And yeah, there's a lot more nowadays. There's lots of options, um, which is wonderful. But yeah, back in the mists of time, <laughs> there wasn't that many things going on. Did you did you catch um, Life Game, which is Keith Johnston's format that Improbable did? And that no. That was that was like a mid scale show. I saw that twice at the Unity, um, so twice at the Everyman. Um, okay. That was absolutely fabulous in terms of what they were attempting to do, which is sort of replaying someone's life through. So it's an interview followed by a replaying of key moments of that person's of, of that person's life. So yeah, um, that was hugely influential in terms of um, what improv could be. Um, Another, speaking of like influential ones, um, I did catch Jacob Bannigan's Game of Death um, at uh, one of the, I think it was a, a London, it was a London venue. Um, I think Jacob was over for one of the uh, improvathons and it was just outstanding. It's one man show, um, so obviously quite influential on myself. But just the the intelligence and the sensitivity that he brings to any sort of stage, just it's insane. You know, he's just a, an a, a amazing, he's a lovely person, uh, which makes it all the worst that he's really, really talented as well. It's just, could you have one flaw, please? <laughs> so he sort of skip forward into sort of inspirations and kind of that yeah. magic that you see in, in improv. Um, the uh, the lovely thing around around seeing something where you just kind of go oh my god that's there are those moments uh, that just stick with you forever and I've got them as both 
sort of audience member and as sort of being involved in something. And I think they're very different, those moments. So in regards to something that you've experienced on stage where you've gone, oh my God, that's amazing. I can't believe we were so, in, you know, it just it all just melded and it just felt effortless and magic. Um, it, it's hard to pin, pin it down to just the one specific uh, happenstance. Um, but you, you get those moments when you're performing and you just, which with whoever you're with, it just sort of clicks and it just sort of gels and it feels amazing. Um, it happens quite a lot when I'm performing with Angie, uh, the wife. Um, when we do our, we do our uh, psychics, um, the Leslie and Leslie de Bondeville, and that that happens quite spookily sometimes because you know obviously we're not psychics because they don't exist. Um, but we'll do stuff and we'll just look at each other and be like. That was weird, but awesome, but weird. And we, it was just like a moment of synchronicity when you're doing that sort of mind meld thing. Um, in terms of instances of seeing it happen, um, I'm reminded that I think it was, I forget which, it was a Liverpool and Probathon. It was the fairy tale one. And there was a character being played by uh, Jonathan Monkhouse, who's a wonderful, wonderful performer. Um, and he was playing Bill Ox. He was half man, half minotaur. <laughs> so, and all the way through, lovely character, helping people along, giving advice, all this sort of stuff. And then just right at the second to last episode or something, he just twisted everything that he said. And I said, and it made him out to be the villain of the entire piece. And I was like, oh, everyone, audience, cast was like, what that's insane but when you thought back it's like oh yeah yeah that's and we don't know whether he planned that the whole time because it's very difficult to plan an improv or if he just thought i'm just going to turn it on my head and it everything just fell into place like that yeah. um also the uh, uh the multiple erotic fountains that we have are, are quite quite magical um <laughs> in, in their in their own regard yeah, gotta love, gotta love me a, a good old erotic fountain. So, so where did you start to uh, have a go at improv? Was you mentioned at, at, at university? Was that something that was being taught, or was it something that somebody a tutor was? <clears throat> um, not per se. No, yeah. uh, like like I say, I've always been from an early age a fan of the whose lines it anyway. So it's always been something that I enjoyed watching. When I got to uni, it wasn't being taught as such, but the tutors would use it in like, you know, warm up games and and stuff like that. And I'd be in the drama society um, and we would do games just to, just to keep our hand in, just to mess about a bit. But it was never a serious thing. But then it was in 2004 and Ken Campbell was doing his uh, Farning Him Out in Disguises show at the Everyman and he held like open auditions and I got in somehow and uh, yeah and there was like the first so that was the first formal improv training that I received and it was through uh, Josh Darcy, Chris Lynham, the infamous clown character, uh, Zoot Lynham, his son, who taught us a very sort of sympathetic and emotional uh, range of improv techniques. Um, some stuff from Ken as well, which was a bit more not quite emotional, um, <laughs> just more fraught um, and dangerous. Um, so that was the first time I did any sort of actual training. And then, yeah, that was for, so oh, it was about 24 or so at the time. And then later on yeah. with impropriety, yeah. we were le learning as we were doing. So would you know, would re do research in t techniques and stuff like that and just try them out and see what worked. And eventually we did shows and, you know, somehow we cobbled together a decent, um, decent crew and a decent show. And then we'd review and say, oh, what worked, what didn't, you know, or that was great or, Ooh. so yeah, so learning through doing. So, because uh, I remember Tor Paul, Teddy yourself, Angie, I think, there were a good amount of people. Ian, Ian Hills. That show. Um, um, yeah, there's quite a uh, which one do you mean in the farting around disguises? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so there's myself. Was Ian in there? Ian wasn't in that one. It's himself, Keddy, uh, Tall Paul. Um, oh, I'm trying to think who you'd know. Anne. Um, I forget, forget her surname. Michael Levantine was in there in the mix. Um, another couple of guys whose names escape me now because I'm terrible with names and faces. But there was, it was quite a quite a mixed bag, and you uh, some people I know who are still in that or are still in recovery from uh, working with Ken. I broke my foot on the third night um, because he made us all so angry. I kicked a wall and then had to walk two miles home. So, yeah. So, uh, the, the the lovely thing, because uh, because obviously Ken was quite a maverick, um, you know his 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 uh, ways of creating stuff was quite notorious, um, but it's just in, uh, the reason I was raising that was because I was thinking, oh my gosh, so that one moment that happened in Liverpool in two thousand and four generated something that came out of that has a ripple effect, and that's 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 quite. That's quite a, a legacy, I guess, to lead. Yeah, to. yeah, Ken and definitely has a legacy in the in this city, um, beyond just you know the Everyman and stuff like that. You know, people know about the the big like eight hour, twenty five hour shows that he used to do. Yeah. Um, but definitely it, he had a huge impact on my life. Um, and it's because of improv that I like to say I joke that improv saved my life but it sort of did because i was going through a pretty dark patch in midlife and improv started up again <clears throat> and it just meant that i had a creative outlet for where it had been missing for a couple of years and it was just the the best thing to happen at that point in time um and yeah i, I owe a lot to it and it's just it's one of those things that people think oh it's just messing about and not learning the lines and stuff like that but it's a lot more than that when you when you dig through the bedrock of it there's a lot more to it than just you know just party games and things like that yeah so i was, I was thinking kind of uh because it kind of leads me into nicely into sort of how has improv impacted on your life um you know i i've used this example before um but um you know i'm far more relaxed when i'm performing on stage than i ever was working with scripted work um and that ability just to uh i think i'm a better listener than i was previously um um so it's those sort of things that inform the everyday i'm guessing what 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 might you say that is there anything that you could think of that's um, you mean as in how am I different now to towards before improv or you might you maybe you're not conscious of it, but more around the idea of what what do you take from your practice of improv into a... okay um I think the the main thing is to not dismiss ideas out of hand and to accept the slightly weird things. Um, because otherwise you're just, you're blocking down areas of creative creativity. Um, so if you're in say like a, you know, scripted rehearsal or whatever, and, and, you know, someone has a say, well, oh, just try, try it this way. And if you were just like, if you were completely anti anything, you just go, no, 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 I'm just going to keep doing it that way. And there, that's the end of the conversation. Um, and it sort of stifling creativity, but the one of the core tenets of improv is accept and build. So if you're in, in this scripted uh, meeting or reading and says, so just try it this way, you'll accept that and you'll you'll give it back to them and you'll build on what they've given you. And it's 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 that level of openness to to the 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 unknown um, that I think a lot of people are afraid of. You know, they'll go in with a certain prescribed way of how things should be done when in reality we're all making it up as best we can and if you're not open to a little bit of you know leeway or a little bit of <clears throat> messing up a little bit of failure then you know you're you're cutting your nose off to spite your face um you know let let people play and you'll, you'll find the magic yes i i 
I mean, lots of acting systems are based. <clears throat> uh, lots of acting systems are based around trying to um, uh, authentically recreate the written text, like it's being said for the first time. Yeah. Um, um, in lots of ways, the uh, improvisation, as as my former tutor described it, is like pure act, pure acting. So he 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 worked with John Hodson, who went over in the se early seventies and went and studied with Second City, and then came back and brought those ideas. Um, so for for him, he was always like, well, um, stand in a different place deliver the line in a different way and see what happens. Like you're saying is experiment a little bit and then sort of finalize some decisions so you can kind of go, oh, okay, that works. We know those yeah. things are in place, but you know, I think sometimes um, systems can be useful, um, but they can also be quite rigid. Uh, and they're so not one size fits all, you know, a system will work for one person, it'll work amazingly for one person, but it won't work for the other person. And there are certain tenets of improv that some people just can't get their heads around. And it's like, but I, I don't understand. And that's fine. It's, it's fluidic. It's, it's dynamic. It's other buzzwords. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> like it. It, it's alive. It's alive for, for want of a better word. And by, uh, it, by taking a lot more flexible approach into, um, your traditional um performance styles then i think that that will help you ultimately help anyone ultimately you know it's i think as 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 artists to use that word you know you need to be open to new things and if someone comes in and says well we're just gonna we're gonna play we're gonna try for a bit that's great sometimes you don't need that sometimes you go in you read the script and oh my god it's grand All right cool let's just do it I, I'm a I'm a Sean Bean school of acting. As I like, get on, say lines, go to pub, <laughs> yeah, pick up paycheck. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love short form. Um, I'm just my brain just doesn't work in that manner. I, I I've tried it. I've you know I use it as a as a mechanism for myself just to train at home and do stuff. Um, yeah, it, it, it just doesn't happen for me at all. Um, my brain is just doesn't work in that in that way. Yeah. Um, okay. So thinking about because you've, I mean, as you mentioned, you set up impro impropriety, and then we had. I, I, it wasn't just me. There was a lot. One of <laughs> you were one yeah. other member of. Uh, yeah. Impropriety, you know, and talking about why. Why? Why did? Why did you kind of go as a collective? Go yes, we're going to do this. Why uh, is that important? Because um, everybody I've spoken to at certain points has gone. Well, it wasn't around, so we just did it. And I quite yeah. like that uh, that attitude of kind of can do. We'll make it happen for ourselves. So, what what was the driver for you um, in terms of impropriety? And then obviously. The improvophons and the soap operas. Yeah. And... Well, the the improv the the main sort of the catalyst behind impropriety setting up was because of the two thousand eight improvathon, which was held in honor of Ken's passing. Um, and in the lead up to that, we had uh, a, quite a few uh, local performers and some performers from London and all this uh, sort of gathered and did workshops and just played and got to know each other and learn from each other and things like that. And then the Improvathon happened and it was just this ridiculous crucible of pain and joy. And uh, the people who went through it and came out the back of it were, were all gluttons for punishment. So we decided, oh no, let, let's keep this going. And it just, the, the group that managed to get together at the time is just like, it's, it's sort of like lightning in a bottle sort of thing. There was, you know, young ones from Lippa who were, you know, had the, the get up and go. There was folks who were just discovering or rediscovering improv like myself and a few others. And we just, there was just a feeling in the air that yes, we want to keep doing this. We want to put shows on. Are we ready? No. Um, and we did, I think after the first show, after the Improvathon, there was 
maybe six months of like workshops and meetings and, and just, you know, getting together and trying stuff out. And then we thought, F it, let's just, let's just do it. And we put a show on it that now, uh, not there anymore, mellow, mellow. And it seemed to go well. And, you know, we kept doing it and we went from, we were doing weekly shows for a while, which was, and having a regular weekly improv show was just unheard of. Um, and yeah, and then eventually we're like, right, let's do an improvathon. And then we put that together and that became a, a, an annual thing. And so, and so it just, it just built, uh, built and built. And eventually we just sort of did, started doing the, um, uh, workshops in schools, stuff like that. And it was just all for the, for the love of improv, spreading the improv joy, I suppose would be you know, the gospel, if you will. Um, so for those yeah. who don't know, could you just explain what the Improvathon was? So an Improvathon is a, a super long form improv show. A long form is a show usually about an hour or so, whereas an Improvathon, I think there's no strict definition of it, but in my mind, it's anything over um, 24 hours. Um, it happens in two hour episodes. Uh, the thing that defines it is that it's the continuous cast and the continuous characters all the way throughout. So um, think of it as a box set of theater. You'll go, you'll see a show, um, say it starts at 12. First 15 minutes, you'll be introduced to the characters in a section known as the Hot 30. Then there'll be a director who calls um, various scenes. So Dave and Jim are in the gym uh, talking about the night before, what have you. There'll be a number of scenes. Um, everyone in the cast will hopefully get up at least twice um, as their main characters. They can be supporting characters, stuff like that. That will go on for about another hour and a half thereabouts. And then there's a 15 minute break for the audience to, you know, recharge, go to the loo, get a drink, whatever. And then we do it again, 17 times in the <laughs> Liverpool case. Um, so the last one, I think the last one we did was 2018, was it 2018? So that's 2038 minutes. Um, so that, yeah, so that's went from the Friday afternoon, no, Saturday afternoon through to Sunday night. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so I've done so many, my maths is broken. <laughs> <clears throat> and it's, it's the goal is that you, if you're doing the whole thing, then you stay awake during the whole thing in order to experience a certain amount of sleeplessness um, and engage what is known as your lizard brain, where you stop thinking and you just accept the reality of the situation with, which you're in. There are dangers to that. It can lead to certain side effects as hallucinations and paranoia and things like that. Um, but on the flip side, there are amazing benefits to be had, such as just said the wrong word. Um, so that's happened to me before. So um, we're coming to that's an improper one. <laughs> Thank you. That's a I really like the idea of the box set. And that's a really nice way of uh... yeah framing it for myself um so you're coming to lift 2023 uh, yep. with a brand new piece of work called trev fleming 42 um, yep. this fascinated me uh i went oh my god this is so dangerous and so brilliant at the same time so i was <laughs> and i know you've done sort of an iteration of it before which sounds yep. even more bonkers um but if you could just explain Perhaps what what an audience might expect when they come and see uh, come and see you. Uh, so they can expect to see forty two individual scenes, um, with hopefully forty two different characters from myself. I'll be supported by a couple of guest stars um, helping out throughout the the thing. Um, the audience will be asked for a word, like there'll be bits of paper you write down a single word. It can be as long or as short as you want. Um, keep it clean. You know, don't be don't be a dick. Um, and uh, I those words will be read out at random, and I create a scene based on those words. Or I, I start a scene, and my scene partners will come and help me when they realize I don't have an idea. Um, and then that that scene will go on for about fifty five seconds or so, 
and they'll either ring a bell or make a noise or you know something like and then we the, the next word will be read out and we start again and we do that 42 times um it might be absolutely terrible it might be tiny bits of amazingness um I, going by past reactions when i've done it it's generally it's a good laugh um there's flex of humanity and pathos in there um, but on the whole it's me having fun on stage um with wordplay and just just having a laugh and seeing where we can go in such short spaces of time and if you don't like it it'll be over in a minute <laughs> oh brilliant um so i was thinking oh, this 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 as a as a format if you want to use that is that where yeah. I was thinking? Wouldn't this be amazing? Like on radio, you know, on radio, or how could it transform into other into other things? Because I think it's such a brilliant, um, such a brilliant idea. Um, so a load of the students that you taught last year um, have already gone. Oh my god, this sounds amazing! We're going to see this, <laughs> yeah, and they've got very excited, and then they're kind of dragging their kind of pals along. So, yeah. uh, so I, I'm really excited to. To, to see it because in my head I have a, this uh, uh, the image of what it would be be like but yeah knowing you and having seen you perform I'm kind of I'm kind of going oh my god this is almost like made for for you to do uh, well it, it it came came about just because I I got guilted into running a half marathon by my own conscious <laughs> Because I, I did a, a charity video a few years back where I was dressed like, you know, the guys who dress up in like superhero costumes and then, you know, run a half marathon. So that, that's the plot of the video. Um, but this this fat guy who can't run um, is on a sofa and he gets convinced by a sad advert to, you know, run for charity. But we filmed it at the start. I was dressed like a superhero. I'm right at the front line of a 10K, the tunnel, Mersey Tunnel 10K. And I'm at the front and all the prof semi-professional runners are at the front uh, because they'll run 10K in like half an hour, 25 minutes or whatever it is. And I'm there all dressed up and they're like, oh, so are you are running the whole thing? I'm like, no, I'm just doing the first 100 yards and then we're, we're cutting away. And they're like, oh, right. So, <laughs> so in my head, I was like, okay, well, I'll sign up next year for the half marathon. Did that and that was hideous. But because I'm a glutton for punishment, I thought, no, I need to do something else. And I had the idea. I don't know. I can't remember specifically where the idea came from for doing like a character a minute for X amount of minutes. And I thought it'd be a great idea to do 500 characters in 500 minutes because it's a nice. Sounds amazing. But then my friends pointed out to me that that's insane. Um, that's like nearly, you know, was it nine hours or something? Um, so I'm like, all oh, right, OK. I'll do 300 minutes, 300 characters in 300 minutes. Um, and they also pointed out that if I did it on the day of a half marathon, I'd die. So we did, I did a half marathon one year, then the show, then the half marathon next year, then another, I think I did 301 um, the next time. So yeah, and both those times were fantastic. I had support from the impropriety um, folks as well. Um, both times for different charities and stuff like that. So 42 is going to be a piece of proverbial. Um, <laughs> and I get some money this time, which is nice. But, you know, <laughs> hopefully if people come and see it, that'd be great. Yeah. So um, what are your favourite books? Are you much of a reader in terms of improv and kind of kind of uh, picking up on on stuff and, and various bits and books? What, what would you recommend that you... Dil Bernard, small, cute book of improv. Very good. In terms of the improv learning and stuff that I've done, it's been mostly practical. Um, so I, I'm not a massive reader. Obviously, there's, you know, impro, Keith Johnson, you know, if you want to read that, then you do you. But I just love the fact that it's it's just it's like it's got pictures, it's got pictures and everything. Um, and there's there's elements and things in here that I, I've used in, in classes that I've, that I've taught myself. Um, it's just bite size, simple, which is how learning should be. Um, yeah, I, I would go for that. Uh, I know um, Paddy Styles as well has a book out at the minute, the name escapes me, 
um but i've worked with patty before she's a american improviser no, canadian improviser living in australia um and i've done the canadian and australian uh sopathons both 54 hours um and patty's just amazing she's just a living legend so i can't remember the name of the book right now so check it out i know the book maybe called it's about uh breaking the rules or something like that i can't remember yeah but you gotta know the rules before you can break the rules so uh, i really like katie shoots book which is on long yeah. and again it's brilliant because it's so bite-sized and digestible uh it's a load of really good uh advice and you just kind of go and then you experience it and then go back and read and you kind of go oh okay and then yeah and, and so i think there's a relationship with with those types of books where you can kind of dip in and dip out and they the yeah. meaning of those words change over time so it matches experience too yeah well I, i've been lucky to, enough to perform with katie and pippa and uh sorry pippa evans you know some of the best improvisers in the world you know mark Meir, jacob bannigan uh oliver senton chris may just some of the just the out best improvisers ever and i've just sort of glommed off them like some kind of talent vampire <laughs> <laughs> um but left them whole and intact but just taking away little snippets of advice and ju or just watching them going oh that's it's it's no great secret for me improv it's just by being open and by being responsive to what's happening on the stage and yeah there's techniques and there's tricks and there's mantras and there's all that sort of stuff but ultimately it's it's about being supportive of your your stage mates and your cast mates and just saying okay how can i help not how can i be funny now or if i say this i'll get a massive laugh it's how can the scene be better how can the audience have a better time doing this it's all the, the worst improviser is usually the one who's like hey guys let's go wacky Right. No, man. No, no. Just yeah. No, it, it it's a collect, collective endeavor. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, as you described, it's that that where things where the synergy happens, and 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 being supportive of each other. Um, yeah. And it doesn't mean you can't flip things on, but you you do it with everybody in mind, as opposed to kind of going, "I'm going to showboat now." Yeah. Yeah. There's there's subverting the narrative of the scene yeah and then being a dick <laughs> yeah. you know ideally the goal is to not be a dick <laughs> yeah. i think that's you know one of the golden rules say yeah yes and build accept and build don't be a dick yeah i i think the, that should be a book title that is written by <laughs> trev fleming uh, okay trev so next year uh, yeah we have an unlimited amount of money money is no yeah. object who would you yeah. invite if, uh, which I hope it will, uh, Lyft 2024 takes place? Who as a guest uh, uh, workshop leader or teacher? Um, I'm just going to be really selfish. And it's uh, there's two shows that I would love to bring. And one is uh, Game of Death by Jacob Bannigan because everyone needs to see it because it's just a virtuoso performance. And, and while I'm at it, I'll bring over Mark Mayer to do improv Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm going to be, ca I'm casting myself in that as well, okay. because I saw it at Wilton's Music Hall when, I, again, I think it was around the same sort of time I saw Game of Death. And it was just gloriously nerdy. I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a massive nerd, as anyone who's ever seen me will uh, uh, know. And just improv d and with Mark Meir as your uh, dungeon master is just fantastic because even if you don't know about D&D &D or you don't have never heard of it or you've never read a fantasy book in your life, it doesn't matter because he just makes it so accessible and brings everyone into the fold. And it's not like, oh, wink, wink, we're, we're no, we know something you don't know, you normie. It's not that, it's just, it's funny. It's a good story. It's it's a rollicking adventure that everyone can get behind. And it was hilarious as well when he kept making uh, one of the other uh, performers drink energy drinks as health potions. <laughs> um, 
but they had to finish the entire cam um, <laughs> stage. And he's like, you take four HP, better drink a health potion. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's just, um, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, those those two for, for sure. Um, I just, while the matter, I'll just pay for the next, we'll have the next Liverpool and Provathon. We'll make it 60 hours. We'll break all the world records. Um, we'll... And we'll bring everyone from Canada and uh, Australia and everywhere. And we'll just turn the unity into our gigantic playground. With two spaces. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a simulcast, yeah, you yeah. know. <laughs> Parallel universes. Oh, alternate timelines. Yeah. Where uh, one timeline is slightly more squished than the other. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talking of time, we're just about... A big thank you to Trev Fleming. Trev and guests will be forming Trev Fleming 42 in the Unity 2 on Friday the 21st of April at 6.15pm. Tickets are £5 and £7 and are still available via the Unity website, which is www.unitytheatreliverpool.co.uk. Go to the What's On page and search for Liverpool Improvisation Festival and all the details for Trev Fleming 42 and other shows are there. Thank you.